Some people say that we're in line for catastrophic sea level rise because of climate change. Is it supported by the science? Let's find out. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. This is one of a series of videos on the theme of climate change, where I step back, abandon all preconceptions, and simply have a look at the state of the scientific research and the science-connected debate, where that's a thing, around a specific topic. This one is focusing on sea level rise. Some are saying that sea level rise is accelerating. Some show graphs like this and say that, on the contrary, it's remarkably steady. Some, like James Hansen, suggest that sea level rise could make the planet practically ungovernable. Others suggest significant change, but within the bounds of what we have already seen in human history. How can there be so many different versions of something that should be so simple? As the saying goes, let's dive in. According to NASA, amongst others, sea levels globally are rising by an average of 3.3 millimetres per year. Of that increase, 2.1 millimetres comes from an increase in ocean mass, so melting ice sheets and glaciers, adding to the quantity of water overall. Out of interest, it takes 362 gigatons of melted land ice to raise sea levels by one millimetre. And 1.1 millimetre in addition to that is steric height, which comes from higher ocean temperatures, meaning that the same quantity of water fills a greater volume because water expands when it becomes warmer. It sounds straightforward, but the deeper you get into the details, well, the more complex the whole thing begins to appear because that average rise figure masks all sorts of other factors. For instance, there can be regional effects that mean that sea levels increase in some places, decrease in others, and remain relatively flat in some others. Sinking coastal land can cause a rise in relative sea level. For example, the California Bay Delta, where some of the islands have dropped to 8 metres or more below sea level, mostly because of microbial oxidation and soil compaction, the impact of a century of farming. Tectonic forces can push some places up, some places down, and although it was a long time ago, about 10,000 years ago, in fact, after the close of the last ice age, the retreat of the truly massive ice sheets from North America and Eurasia took a huge weight off the underlying mantle deep below the surface of the Earth. And that mantle is still in the process of slowly, ever so slowly rebounding, raising the rock layer above and changing the shape of the ocean basins. This effect, which obviously is caused by ancient, not modern climate change, widens the ocean basins, which lowers the apparent sea level by about 0.3 millimetres per year. If you're just interested to know what your local sea level currently is, that doesn't really matter. If you want to know how much sea levels overall have been impacted by climate change, it's a factor that you need to take into account. There are other factors that people think make a difference, but don't. Sea ice, for instance. Ice that's already floating doesn't make much difference at all to sea level when it melts. The only reason it makes even a small difference is because of different salinity, not because of the quantity of water. And then there are other factors that are highly variable and do make a difference. The global hydrological cycle influences the amount of rainfall over land versus ocean. Different rainfall levels in El Nino versus La Nina years make a significant difference, as can water management practices such as dams and reservoirs, irrigation and groundwater extraction. All of these can influence the amount of surface water runoff into the ocean, which influences sea level. And that's just global sea levels. There are other factors that can affect regional sea level rise, including the buildup of sediment or the extraction of subsurface substances such as gas or petroleum. According to the IPCC, regional sea level rise can exceed mean level sea level rise by more than 10 centimetres per year. So beware people are arguing using just data from one or two specific locations to prove a point about global sea levels. If someone even tries to do that, you should assume they either don't know what we're talking about or they're deliberately giving you data that backs up a specific position that they're pushing that may come from either side of the debate but doesn't necessarily reflect global sea levels. So those are some of the complications. How do we measure sea level rise? Before 1992, the only measurements we had were from tide gauges. 
tide gauges measure the variations of sea level, finding the mean sea level by recording the highest point of the high tide and the lowest point of the low tide and the midpoint is the mean. Several gauges go back to the 18th century, but not many. And so our first challenge with all of this is that recording sea level is actually quite a difficult thing to do. When we're talking about a millimetre or three in terms of annual sea level rise, measuring that small amount of difference with tide gauges simply isn't easy to do. If you're wanting to look back into history, the big problem is just how few tide gauges there were, as these maps give you some idea. They were unevenly distributed around the world. There's missing data from some of them. And of course, some of them are in places that are subject to land movements, either up or down. All of that goes to create a significant degree of uncertainty. Not the sort of uncertainty that would confuse a falling sea level for a rising one worldwide or anything like that, but uncertainty as to the rate of change. For instance, a number of estimates of mean sea level rise have been published to cover the 20th century. 1.9 millimetres per year translates into 7.5 inches over the century, whereas 1.1 millimetre per year would equal 4.3 inches. Obviously, that's a significant range of uncertainty for what we've already seen in recent history. Since 1992, we've added to the tide gauge information with measurements by satellite, which has significantly improved our understanding of how local variability in global sea rise often plays out. As always, when dealing with satellite measurements of anything, you have to do quite a bit of processing to the raw satellite data to turn it into sea level information, including the correction of shifts caused by aging and changing satellites. When you look at the satellite records, the average rate of sea level rise over the period it covers is around 2.6 to 3.2 millimetres per year. You can see there are significant variations year to year which are associated with the El Nino Southern Oscillation. The large trend between 2011 and 2016 is associated with a very strong La Nina in 2011 and a very strong El Nino in 2016. You remember that I said these cause changes in the global hydrological cycle and the distribution of rainfall. You can get a paucity of land water and an increase in sea level during an El Nino and the opposite during La Nina. So as always, you can't tell real trend data from relatively short periods of time. You have to look towards the longer term. Well, let's start off talking about the very long term, what we think we know about sea levels over the last 20,000 years, the period we know as the Holocene. This followed the last glaciation, which saw huge amounts of the world's water locked up in massive ice sheets. So unsurprisingly, the end of the glaciation saw major rises of sea level around 120 metres, 400 feet. During the main portion of the deglaciation from about 17,000 to 8,000 years ago, global sea levels rose at an average rate of about 12 millimetres per year, around about half an inch, which is interesting because when people look at the current rate of a little over three millimetres a year, they tend to say, well, that's not very much. But it's as just a quarter of the rate of increase of when we were coming out of a major deglaciation. Then over the last 6,000 years, we achieved relative climate stability. Note, I say relative, which was since the disappearance of the last remnants of the North American Laurentide ice sheet. There was a point called the Mid-Holocene High Standpoint around 6,000 to 3,000 years ago, when the sea level in some regions was up to 5 to 8 feet higher than at the present. This was associated with the so-called Holocene Optimum, during 8,000 to 4,000 BC, when average global temperatures reached their maximum level during the Holocene and were warmer than pre-industrial temperatures by approximately 0.6 to 0.8 degrees centigrade. Analyses of exactly what's been the case with sea level over the last two millennia have been inconclusive, with several studies highlighting significant uncertainties. One study by Kopp et al thought that global sea level varied by around 7 to 11 centimetres with a decline over 1000 to 1400 AD. Another by Grinstead et al suggested that variations were greater with a significant drop between 2000 BC and 500 BC, setting the scene for a tendency for sea level to rise progressively during the time of a Roman Empire and higher sea levels during the medieval warm period. Now there are some big differences between those two. The one by Grinstead looks more intuitively in line with what you would expect given that the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age happened, 
Although, as we so often see, just because something doesn't match your intuitive expectations doesn't mean it's definitely wrong because there can be many other factors in play. Nevertheless, one thing we can safely conclude is that the differences between these two versions do tell us that the uncertainties of what was happening with sea levels before the time when we were measuring it are considerable. So what do we take from the long-term historical trends? Some might say that the point is we've seen higher sea levels before and the world didn't come to an end, which is a thing, I suppose, if you're arguing with someone who's saying that because of sea levels alone, the world will come to an end. I guess there are people like that, obviously not on this very non-alarmist and reasoned channel, but there may be some who argue that. But it's worth noting that while the world won't come to an end with sea level rises on the higher end of what we would expect, we do now have many, many more millions of people living in coastal locations. So the degree of disruption to human society that will come with those higher scenarios eh, probably shouldn't be underestimated. So understanding what's going to happen in the future is definitely of interest to us and of interest to us to understand what's really likely to happen, not just what we might prefer to have happen. To have that discussion, we start by zooming into the more recent history. The IPCC AR5 report had this to say about sea level rise since 1900. It is very likely that the mean rate of global average sea level rise was 1.7, 1 1.5 to 1.9 millimetres per year between 1901 and 2010 and 3.2, 2.8 to 3.6 millimetres per year between 1993 and 2010. It is likely that similarly high rates occurred between 1920 and 1950. Skeptical scientist Judith Curry, in her report on sea level rise, looks at those figures and makes this comment. The significance of the early 20th century acceleration in global sea level rise is this. This acceleration in the early 20th century was not caused by man-made warming. Hence, the recent acceleration in global sea level rise since 1995 cannot be attributed to man-made warming without explaining why the mid-century acceleration occurred and why these same factors do not explain the recent acceleration. To support her contention that the early rise isn't created by man-made warming, she produced this graph, juxtaposing sea level rises with CO2 emissions. It's worth noting that there isn't solid agreement about the shape of the graph. The one she used, and which supports the narrative from the 2013 IPCC report, was by Jevra Jeva et al. This graph differs markedly from the others, such as the one by Church and White. Climate scientist Grant Foster, blogging as Tamino, criticised it because it uses a variant of the first difference method in order to align different records together to make an average. According to Foster, that means that it introduces a random variation flaw, which he illustrates on some randomly generated non-trending data. It also uses the virtual station method, which can inflate the importance of isolated individual stations. In comparing that graph with the church and white one, you can see that the slightly contentious high rate of sea level increase in the early half of the century does not exist in anything like the same degree in the other graph. Do I conclude, therefore, that the church and white graph must be the correct one? Well, Grant Foster's arguments are very coherent and persuasive, but let's be honest, neither you nor I probably have the ability to make that judgment. When you get disputes between scientists, you can note the disputes, you can listen to the arguments and see what the variations tell us. What you don't want to do is simply find whichever one suits what you most want to believe and then decide that's the one that is obviously true. I gather that people get very excited about this question as evidenced by Judith Curry's commentary. The Jevra Jeva graph is much more preferred by the sceptics, apparently. But looking at it, I'm not sure it's not one of those questions, the significance of which isn't completely overblown. The official response to that isn't unreasonable, which is to note that the early part of that increase is in line with natural variability. According to several studies, the anthropogenic contribution to sea level during the 20th century accounts for around 50%, with less of that impact coming in the first half of the century, the majority coming after 1970. Temperatures have been broadly rising since a little before 1850, so the thermal expansion of the ocean in response to that alone would be something that you'd expect to see and would create rising sea levels. But with that comes the key question. 
Is sea level accelerating in its rise or is it stable? Bearing in mind that when it comes to the climate, nothing's really stable in the long term. But over the next century, it might be an important distinction. You see graphs like this one with their straight line plots that seem to suggest that it's all very flat. And it has been for a long time. But at the same time, the IPCC says the trend is accelerating, as do many other agencies. Remembering what I said about how individual tide gauges may not be representative of the global whole, what is the evidence that supports the contention by some that sea level rise is accelerating, not static? I mean, you would intuitively expect to see that, right? If the rate of melting land ice is increasing and the global temperatures are rising, we may only be at the start of the acceleration, but you'd expect to see acceleration. If you didn't see that, then there's something wrong. Grant Foster again demonstrates how you can analyse an apparently straight line graph to check whether there's any sort of underlying trend. Here are the NOAA star figures for average sea level rise. It looks like the sort of graph a Tony Heller would produce with a straight line drawn along it, which sort of looks like it describes a flat upwards progression. The way to identify a trend from the noise is to subtract the best fit straight line from the data and then see the residual data that's left over. If there's no trend, it'll be just noise. If there's a trend, it will be amplified to the degree that it's clearly visible. When you do that, this is what it looks like. The trend is shown with a quadratic line in blue and a linear spline in red, both clearly showing that there's a pretty solid accelerating trend. The NOAA star data isn't the only satellite set. There's also the University of Colorado data, Copernicus in Europe, the European Space Agency, and CSIRO in Australia. So does all this mean that, like James Hansen said, the planet will become ungovernable? In 2016, there was a paper by De Conto and Pollard that argued that there was serious danger with the Antarctic ice sheet of what it called marine ice cliff instability, suggesting that huge blocks of ice, huge blocks of ice could collapse into the sea, which would lead to relatively abrupt, much larger than predicted increases in sea levels, maybe up to an additional metre. This, as you can imagine, caught the imagination of headline writers and campaigners alike. However, a couple of more recent papers suggested that seemed a lot less likely than had been suggested. One was by Tamsin Edwards, one of the climate scientists who rather notably told Extinction Rebellion's Rupert Readoff for giving misleading apocalyptic talks to children. While neither paper suggested that it was impossible, it nevertheless makes the standard IPCC scenarios by far the most likely ballpark figures, which means around 0.3 to 1.2 metres by 2100. That reflects some degree of disruption to a number of coastal communities, particularly bear in mind that when land gets reclaimed by the sea, it doesn't necessarily happen nicely, one millimetre at a time. Historically, we've seen that it often happens with storm surges that can be extremely abrupt and violent. So there is no reason to be complacent. Continued increases will need to be adapted for. So the answer to the question, the evidence does appear to support accelerating sea level rise, but that doesn't fit with the description of ungovernable societies to any degree. It is a manageable problem if we actually take action in the locations that will be the most affected.